Hi everyone, my name is Rita Grays and I'm a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Auburn. I'd like to welcome you all again to our event and remind you that it's sponsored by Our STEM Story, the College of Science and Medicine Office of Inclusion, Equity, and Diversity, and is supported by the Auburn University Office of Inclusion and Diversity. Before beginning, I'd also like to acknowledge that our university and city exist on the original homeland of the Muskogee people. This is a short introductory lecture for our main event with the amazing Dr. Janina Jeff. The conversation with Dr. Jeff will address some of the reasons that Black people may be hesitant to accept the guidance of researchers and medical professionals, and will look towards solutions to the potential negative consequences for the Black community. First, some context. This is not a history lecture, and it's not an expert treatment of the topic. We'll all get to talk to Dr. Jeff soon and learn more about this question from her expert perspective and her personal insights. The role of this introduction is actually to share one person's learning experience from a non-expert perspective and put the story in the context of research ethics as that's the thread that ties our STEM story events together. Since I'm the one who's giving this lecture, it reflects my learning process, and it's shaped by where I started with my learning, my previous learning with our STEM story, and my perspective as a geneticist and an educator. I also want to be explicit here that what I can cover in this lecture is bounded by the time limit and by my own experiences and biases. It's also guided by our wish to provide an unvarnished look at the real history of scientific and biomedical research in the context of minority contributions, including those that were involuntary and often traumatic. The goal is to answer the question, why is there so much distrust within the Black community of scientific and biomedical research, associated institutions, and professionals in these fields? As I have been giving these lectures on the relevancy of research ethics, to topics thus far covered in our STEM story events, my learning process was shaped by this framework. How can I, given this framework of research ethics, understand the history of Black American experiences with science and medicine? To tell the story of my own learning and how I answered this question for myself, I've selected moments in time to highlight and contrast the unethical acts that give rise to lasting distrust and the story of the development of research ethics. The research ethics side of the timeline will be on the left, and the history of unethical acts on the right. It's an unavoidable fact that distrust started at the very beginning of the history of Black people in America, and that dehumanization and atrocities were the rule rather than the exception for experiences of the Black community with science and medicine from the very start. One of the things that stood out to me when I was learning about how medicine was practiced on enslaved people was that the start of scientific ethics actually dates to almost the same period of time. So the first statement creating a framework for research ethics was published about a year after slavers first kidnapped people living in Africa, subjected these people to an abusive and deadly trip to the Americas, and then sold them as slaves. We begin our research ethics timeline in 1620 with the idea that science should benefit humanity. We can ask if this had any measurable effect on the interactions between scientists and medical doctors with enslaved people, and it did not. So here we have the dawn of research ethics, but not for everyone. Medicine practiced on enslaved people was done in the context of racist dehumanization and under awful conditions, without consent and with abusive and traumatic outcomes. One of the best documented cases was the non-consensual practice of medicine by Dr. James Marion Sims on enslaved people. Dr. Sims was also viewed as the founder of gynecology. So if you read about the history of gynecology, this is the person who is credited as the father of modern gynecology. In the 1800s, Dr. Sims was developing this field, including new surgical techniques. For example, he was developing a way to repair vasco-vaginal fistulas. To do this, he tested his surgery on enslaved black women that he owned. There are three known victims, and there are many unknown victims. 
The woman who is pictured in the illustration on the right is one of the three known victims at Arca. She suffered from this condition, um, and in the process of Dr. Sims developing this surgery, he subjected her to at least 30 experimental surgeries, which were all done without anesthesia. See, Dr. Sims believed that black people do not feel pain, and also that the administration of anesthesia would adversely affect his studies. After developing the technique, he used it on many other enslaved black women and also on white women in the context of his practice. How was this viewed in the context of the developing ideas of research ethics? Often you see excuses made that would seek to downplay the impact of these kinds of abuses and exonerate those responsible due to the times or due to good intentions or due to assumed consent. However, the context of these kinds of apologies uh, for history and for bad actors in history is often defensive, and in this case it relies on the assumption that Dr. Sims is a trustable narrator of his own work done on women that he owned. I would also like to point out here that in addition to the considerable modern criticism of Dr. Sims, his testing of his techniques on enslaved people didn't go unnoticed at the time. One example of a prominent doctor who is critical of Sims is Dr. Daniel Hale Williams. He was a contemporary of Sims, although toward the end of Dr. Sims's career. He was a black American surgeon, and he had a phenomenal career. He is actually the first person to successfully perform an open heart surgery. In addition to many lasting contributions to medicine, he also publicly condemned Dr. Sims's practices on the grounds that they were unethical. And he also published critiques demanding proof of other racist assertions that Dr. Sims had made in a medical context. Overall, when we look at the history of the experiences of enslaved people with medicine, we see a history of racist medical practice built on dehumanization and abuse of black people. And that becomes the foundation for further development of science and medicine. And it extends well past the existence of specific criticisms of these practices on ethical grounds. So what happens after the era of slavery and as we have more free black people becoming part of science and medicine? Does it get better? The story shifts, but we still don't have a foundation of trust. Instead, we see lies, continued abusive practices, exploitation, and unequal protection under the law. There are many experiments which included exploitative and abusive practices, but perhaps the best known are the Tuskegee experiments, which spanned a very large stretch of time, starting in 1932. The researchers recruited 600 black men, with about two-thirds of the people recruited suffering from syphilis. The men were told that they were being treated for bad blood, which was a general term that included syphilis at the time. In fact, this was an egregious lie. They were not being treated. And even after 1943, when a treatment was known and widely available, the men that were part of the study were still not treated. One thing that I want to point out here is that the date, 1943, really stands out to me because this is just before the biggest landmark and sea change in the relationship between research ethics and the law. At this time, the Nazis were conducting extensive human experimentation and committing abuses and atrocities, and these acts were committed by scientists and medical doctors in Nazi Germany. In our last Our Stem Story event, the lecture actually focused on this human experimentation, and those doctors who were put on trial during what was called the doctor's trial were caught and they were charged. And this process is the genesis of the first time anyone had actually written down what you must do as a medical practitioner in order to do an ethical medical research experiment that involves human beings. This code was written as part of the verdict, and it consists of a list of 10 principles, which we now call the Nuremberg Code. The Nuremberg Code is the foundation of all later laws, like the National Research Act of 1973. And I'll note here that that act, the National Research Act of 73, comes about partly as a result of the Tuskegee experiment. So how long did the Tuskegee experiment continue past development of the Nuremberg Code in 1947, such that it could be a direct influence on a law that was passed in 73? Recalling that in 43, there's a widely available treatment 
continued until 1972. In 1972, an advisory panel was commissioned and they concluded that the study had to end due to ethical violations and that there was no ethical justification for that study. This is why the Tuskegee experiment influences the law regarding research ethics as late as 1973. And I'll note here that the advisory panel also coincides with development of the Tuskegee Health Benefit Program, which did provide medical care for these men and later on was expanded to provide medical care for their families. When we look at this history of unethical human experimentation, including the Tuskegee experiment, we see that it disproportionately impacts the black community. And we also see that these experiments last well past breakthrough developments in the area of research ethics. What allowed this to be so widespread? Is it just racist scientists and doctors? It can't be. The dominant culture, society, and government must be complicit to allow this to happen at this scale. To highlight this, I'm going to also talk about racist scientific programs in American government, and I'm going to use eugenics as an example. So you might be asking yourself, what's eugenics? Eugenics is an idea that stated that you could treat human beings the way you would animals used in breeding. You could select for positive or negative traits to improve the population. It flourished in the early 1900s with the first compulsory sterilization laws passed based on the idea of eugenics in the United States in 1907 in Indiana. This idea was widely popularized at exhibits like you see in the image shown on the right and within the scientific community, especially by geneticists, the people in my own field. The image shown here actually highlights that. We see people attending a eugenics exhibit in Kansas. The board that you see to the left of the image that is blown up here actually is standard fare in a modern genetics class. What you're seeing is a depiction of the genetics of coat color, but here it's being used as an example of applying genetic knowledge to the control of breeding of human beings. One of the goals of our STEM story is to show the roots and connections between each of our events. So I'm going to take a very brief moment here to emphasize that eugenics is an exceptionally dangerous idea. In fact, it's the genesis of the Holocaust with ideas that were popularized, developed, and promoted here in America, influencing Nazi rhetoric and leading to the final solution, which is the genocide of all people, especially Jewish people, that the Nazis felt polluted their population. If you want to know more about the Holocaust, human experimentation, and the connection to the history of research ethics in that context, you can go to the RSTEM Story website and view our prior event, which featured Andy Sarkany, a Holocaust survivor, and you get to hear his lived experience. So many people are aware of the role of eugenics in the Holocaust. But what's lesser known is that compulsory sterilization laws based on the idea of eugenics were popular in America and lasted well past the period of Nazi Germany. After we have the first law in 1907, upwards of 30 states adopt forced sterilization laws and programs, and these programs target black women and other people of color. It's not until 1981, with shifting views in the scientific community and considerable activism, that forced sterilization ends in America, and the last law is struck from the books in Mississippi in 2008. The last thing that I want to highlight is that this history feeds itself, with rational distrust and continued racist priorities leading to further disparity in healthcare and health-related research. We desperately need more Black Americans to be involved in biomedical science and medicine. So here's one example of how lack of representation in the field impacts science and the benefit of that science to Black Americans. One of the largest breakthroughs in biomedical research was the Human Genome Project. This starts in 1990, and it grows with the adding on of more and more genomes. At first, these genomes lack diversity. And then we see efforts championed by greats like Dr. Dunstan, who's over here on the left, repping ethics, to grow that diversity. So Dr. Dunstan was a vocal critic of the lack of diversity in the samples used for the initial project. 
But then she puts in the work to make it right. She gets a huge grant for Howard University, and she becomes the founding director of the National Human Genome Center. This is amazing work, and it has a benefit to science, and it has a broader benefit to Black Americans and to other people of color and people all over the world who are now included in the Human Genome Project. However, you can see on the right that even with these advances and growing diversity in terms of the data, a very recent study that was published in Nature found that genomic studies as a whole are still heavily biased toward people that are of European descent. Only about 2% of the data, as of 2018, come from people of African descent. So while there's a well-established set of legal protections for some aspects of biomedical science, like experimentation involving humans, and this has led to vast improvements and better equity in how research subjects are recruited and treated, there are still abuses. We still have a lack of representation and continued disparity in health and medicine. Overall, we can see that the foundations of Black American experiences with science and scientists, with medicine and doctors, starts with dehumanization and atrocities committed during the time of slavery, and that thread continues all the way to the lived experiences of Black Americans today. Why so much distrust, atrocity, dehumanization, racist ideas, and abuse? Lies and exploitation, lack of equity, systemic racism, and widespread complicity in this system. And finally, disparity and lack of representation. So what are the solutions? Well, at first I felt very awkward about offering any opinion on this. I wanted to lean on expertise and personal experience, which I don't have. However, while the history is deep and complex, the solution is really shockingly obvious. My conclusion after this learning experience is simply that to build trust as scientists, as biomedical researchers and health practitioners, we must be trustworthy. So that means ethical practices, truth telling, pursuit of justice, building equitable systems, equal representation and accessible education like this event, Our STEM Story. We hope that by highlighting the clarity of an ethics-based approach to solutions, it'll be easier to talk about. You don't need to be an expert to contribute to the discussion with Dr. Jeff. Thank all of you for being here and for being part of our STEM story.